What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Crypto Creamers. I'm here with Rick Burr, aka Crypto Cloaks, and Zach Herbert. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Right. Co founder and CEO of Foundation Devices. What's up, guys? How's it going? Chilling, man. How you doing, Rick? Pretty good, man. Thanks for having me again. Bro, thanks for coming on. It's always a pleasure. Any quarantine stories you guys have? No, I'm uh, not really even quarantined that much. Minnesota's pretty open. Boston, Boston is pretty locked down, but it's cool. All the restaurants are in the street. It almost reminds me of uh, Europe right now. So you can go like sit outside. It's actually getting better. Yeah. That's awesome. Miami's fucking mayhem right now, bro. It's <laughs> like the hotbed. So everything's closed. It sucks. Um, I've been stuck here at my girlfriend's house for like three months, but you know, can't complain. Anyways, before we get into the gritty and what you guys are working on, I just want to get your guys' opinion. What did you guys think of the Twitter hack yesterday? Was it good or bad for Bitcoin? Uh, I guess, I guess I personally think it's good. Any publicity is good for Bitcoin. I guess it gets it to millions of people. I know people always say, well, that's, that's bullshit. If all publicity is good publicity, but I think there was a lot of people that didn't know what Bitcoin is. And now they're like, well, why is Bill Gates or Elon Musk randomly talking about Bitcoin? What is this? And it probably brings up the question and maybe they start going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> for yeah, sure, for I, sure. I agree. I agree for sure. I feel like all news is good news. And I think I think I saw somewhere that Bitcoin was now, it's like the third highest Bitcoin has ever trended on Twitter. Um, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty good. And then also it helps our argument with regard to like decentralizing infrastructure, right? It's like, it's like the perfect argument I think if anyone normal comes around and says, why, why does it matter? Why do you need decentralization? You can just be like, remember what just happened to Twitter the other day? So I think it, uh, I think, I think it helps with like with the arguments for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Zach, before we dive in, I did a podcast with Rick before, so yeah. everyone kind of knows their background. Zach, what's your background? I know, I, dude, I've, I've been talking to you for almost two years now. I know that you started yeah. uh, designing ASICs and then, you moved on to basically designing a hardware wallet. So could you walk us through that whole experience? Yeah, I can do like an abridged version. Um, so I am a mechanical engineer by training um, and I've been uh, working in the space since the beginning of 2017. Uh, most recently, I was at a company called Nebulous uh, that makes SIO, which is the decentralized cloud storage project um, and Obelisk, which is an ASIC miner producer. Um, so I spent most of my time on the Obelisk side of things, uh, helped oversee the product design for the ASICs and coordinate the different teams, like on the mechanical side, the electrical side, you know, oversee production of what was uh, over 12,000 units of, of ASIC miners actually in the, in, in the U.S., in the New England area, which was pretty cool. And then, uh, you know, getting them shipped out to thousands of customers across the world. So um, I've always loved hardware. I've uh, been really into computers since I was a little kid and uh, just really excited to be able to, you know, work in hardware in the space. And um, our team started Foundation Devices uh, in April of, of this year. So kind of in the middle of the, <laughs> of the whole pandemic and everything. But uh, it's been really awesome and uh, I'm definitely excited to tell you guys both about what we've uh, been working on. Awesome. That, that's really cool. Um, so man, it's it's just it's it's always good to hear, you know, that there's just so so many smart people in 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 the crypto space. And I know Rick, you're also another engineer. You're also a smart guy. Industrial um, engineer. I tried doing nice. mechanical for a while, but I didn't like it that much, so I switched to industrial. But <laughs> I actually started with computer and then just decided I liked the tangible things just too much and so switched to mechanical. <laughs> right. I tried computer yeah. too and I did not like that at all. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. You got, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, Elon's podcast with Joe Rogan. He's like, you need engineers because people need to build shit. So you guys are the people building shit. That's fucking dope. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I feel like I, I love obviously what's going on in the software side of things, of course, you know, with Bitcoin and everything else. But I feel like when you, when you like make something and hold it in your hand or like when, uh, when you actually walk through like a manufacturer and like see them producing, what you design there's like there's nothing like that feeling and it's awesome. just i feel like the tangible stuff is, is just so cool yeah yeah we need more of that yeah there's not enough 
That's for Def sure. Definitely, definitely. I completely agree. So, uh, Rick, I already asked you this, uh, which was basically when and why you got into Bitcoin. So I'm going to change it up a little bit. Yeah. So, when, so everyone has this kind of eureka moment when it comes to Bitcoin. I know that I had one. So I want to hear yeah. yours. My, my moment, huh? Your eureka moment where you were on the toilet. I was on the toilet, right? So that's why I remember. I was on the toilet and I was like, whoa. And there's just like all, you know, possibilities started flooding through my head. So what was yours, bro? I would, I'd probably have to say maybe a, maybe a year ago when, when it, like maybe right before 2020 started, honestly. Because 2020, if people don't have that moment this year, I don't know if they're going to have it because there's just so much shit going on globally with the, like, economics and just the entire system that it really opens your eyes and you're like holy shit i think i think bitcoin it, it's here to it's obviously here to stay it's just it's really important that's why we need decentralized money so so badly absolutely and and uh zach I, i'm gonna save that question hopefully for the second time you come on the pod uh sure. so i'm gonna start off with the question i asked rick last time he came on when and why did you get into Bitcoin? Yes, yeah, so I got into Bitcoin in the uh, end of 2013, um, back a little bit, uh, I think before the Mt. Gox stuff, you know, back when there was Coinbase already did exist. Um, I was just talking to a friend in college in the dining hall, and he was just telling me about Bitcoin. And then like 20 minutes later, I was like, here, man, here's 20 bucks. Can you just send me some Bitcoin from your account? And so that was my, that was like my first Bitcoin on the spot. I think back then I was much more excited about the idea of like building more efficient financial system, cutting out all the middlemen, like allowing people to just own money directly and transact directly. And so I thought of it more, maybe more from like an engineering perspective, you know, like, oh, this is so cool. This is a more efficient system. And then of course, you know, number go up, right? So it's mm -hmm. like, got, had to, had to get into it. But I feel like over the last couple of years, maybe the last like year and a half um, after uh, really just being exposed to a lot of cool ideas on Bitcoin podcasts and Bitcoin Twitter. Um, my, my opinion has like, uh, it's changed. It's gone from like the more efficient system to like the sovereignty angle, right? The idea of giving people control, giving people privacy um, and giving people like ownership over their, their lives. Really, you know, it's like the, like the fix the money, fix the world. Right. That's like the Marty Bent uh, tail. I love that so much type, type, type <laughs> comment. Right. So that, that's what I'm really into now. And so what, you know, I'm excited about what we're doing because it's like building hardware products where you can actually give people sovereignty is, is just super cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it's just, I, I was talking to uh, keep it, Sim keep it simple. Bitcoin. Uh, he's also another YouTuber. And we, we had this, like long form conversation we were just talking about everything you know just what bitcoin means to different people and you're absolutely right and what i've noticed in speaking to so many bitcoiners like you and rick is that bitcoin means different things to different people right so for the venezuelan it's just a way to hedge against inflation but for people in the west it's like you know number go up it's what you said right so for some people it's like survival like a little lifeboat in the middle of this tragic economy and then for us it's kind of like you know it's like a sign of hope right so and it just brings people together over these exactly what you said zach over this these these strong ideas right and it's just it's so it's so it's like a virus it spreads so easily once you know you know yeah for sure so, uh, Rick, I saw that you have been working on awesome stickers. Um, I yeah. was talking to Rick, basically. Or no, sorry. What did I say? Rick, I was talking to Lucho. I just did a podcast with him, and he has some amazing stickers. But, bro, I love these, too. <laughs> Dude, those uh, are sweat. Those are sweats. Those aren't mine. Okay. My bad. Um, yeah, Sweatoshi made those. He actually he surprised us and sent it to our shop. Oh, shit. Okay. He sent so, it back. My bad. I thought they were yours, but dude, those uh, are pretty awesome, though. <laughs> yeah, that's pleb stickers, man. We're in the. I love pleb so much. Like I, I'm a pleb myself, and the fact that I got that from Sweat was huge. Dude, they're sick. I they love the stickers, sick. bro. I love the stickers. Um, here, let me pull one up that you were working on. Uh, but yeah, dude, it, and I was talking to uh, Lucho, and I love the way he's approaching it. Because the way yep. he's approaching it is kind of, and, and I love, he, he, he claims he's like a propagandist and that, that's such a good way to put it, right? Because yeah. 
I think it's so important that Bitcoin is essentially, and I know this sounds kind of like lame, but Bitcoin is essentially winning the meme war against the dollar. And memes are actually a very efficient way of getting an, a message across in a very 100%, 100% condensed agree. message, right? Definitely. Yep. So uh, here, let's try that again. All right. So, dude, this yeah. is dope. This is dope. Oh, nice. This is cool. And I, 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 I kind of know what it is, but I, I, wanna, I want the artist to describe it. So what is this, Rick? So this was, this was going to be one of our new logo for Crypto Cloaks. Just be, try to get like a 3D printer kind of deal into the logo. But I really liked it more for the, the Telegram group that we started. And really anybody that is getting into 3D printing, I want that aspect out there. And I was like, well, I, th I think eventually I'll start, I'll probably put a Bitcoin symbol in there too. I have that model. So I think I'm going to bring that sticker out there too. But it's just to show that the two, the two are so connected. They go hand in hand. 3D printing community and Bitcoin community, like I said in the other podcast, they, they're like almost going for the same ideas. And I'm, I'm really trying to bridge that gap and say, hey, Bitcoiners, you should get a 3D printer. Hey, 3D printers, you should get into Bitcoin because yeah. we're all really trying to fight the system for the same thing. Absolutely, for sure. And I think the last time we did the podcast um, – I would just, I heard you talk and I was like, dude, I'm getting a 3d printer. That's it. You know, the whole <laughs> pandemic happened and I just kind of got distracted and I'm, I'm going to follow get up. one for sure. Yeah, dude, I got, I, I got I one start right playing here, around. but it's a, uh, it's oh, on dude, the company. It's I, on I the got, company, so, I got yeah, that yeah. image for later. Um, anyways. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, Zach, I wanted to ask you, look, from what I've been noticing, uh, especially uh, with the with the existing hardware wallets like uh, Ledger, Cold Card, Trezor, and the Kobo Vault, um, what is your what is your what is the design philosophy behind the foundation hardware wallet? Yeah, so the design philosophy for us is to be as intuitive and as approachable as possible for a normal user. I think that there's definitely some good hardware, hardware wallets out there, right? I love cold card. I personally use cold card. I think it has the best security architecture. You know, it's open source throughout, but it does have a secure element chip to store like the private keys on it. So it's just much more secure device in my opinion than the existing options. Um, but I wanted something that was, you know, more easy to use for myself really. Uh, and then also for more mass market users, right? I feel like during the next bull market, um, users are going to have a choice. They're going to either buy their coins on like Coinbase and keep them there, or they're going to be delete Coinbase. store them themselves. Exactly. Delete right? Coinbase. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> and delete so, Coinbase. so like, I think it's important. We ask ourselves, you know, do the hardware wallets that we have, you know, like, are, are they easy enough for a normal consumer to use? And are, do they have the right security model that we want normal consumers to use? And, when we were talking about it, you know, internally before we started foundation, you know, the answer was, was no, I didn't have anything like I personally was happy with as, uh, as someone who is, who's like, can kind of bridge the gap between technical and non-technical. I wanted something that was much more like Apple, like in, in design. Um, and then also just as secure as cold card. And so that's really our philosophy. Like we don't think you should have to learn how to use a hardware wallet. Like a great example is if you're using a ledger, you know, you pick it up and then one of the first things you have to do is set your eight digit pin, but you only have two buttons. And so just like those kinds of small design things, I think they, they really have an impact on mass adoption. And so we're hoping that like, you know, our solution is, is seen by the market as, as very simple and elegant, uh, but still really, you know, trustable and secure. Got you. So I, and I, and I love how you put that, which is basically, the usability of an iPhone. So a five-year-old could do it. So you could pick it up and you don't need to learn a new way to input, uh, you know, uh, whatever into a device. So I like that part, but also the security of the cold card. So that's really interesting. I love that. That's, it's really interesting. That's a really cool philosophy. And look, Zach, I kind of want to, I kind of want to do like, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know what to call it, uh, whatever. I, I don't know what to call it, but I, I want you to pretend that uh, you, you just ran into Rick on an elevator and I want you to kind of give him a quick pitch on what a hardware wallet is and why pick the foundation wallet. Yeah, sure. Oh, I like this. 
And this is this is tough. I wish you had given me this question in advance. You know? So so look, I, I can't I can't do that. They're all surprised. Anyway, so I want you Elevator. to look, I want you to look Rick sure. directly in the eyes and be like, you just I'm ran into him. the scenario is that you ran into him in an elevator. You have thirty seconds, or I'm not going to give you thirty seconds. Two minutes, three minutes, whatever. You know, it's an elevator. There's a hundred floors, okay, and yeah. you want to convince him to get a hardware wallet, and you want to convince them specifically to get a foundation hardware wallet. Sure. So, Rick, uh, do you like Bitcoin? I do. I am obsessed with it. Yeah. So, I think one of the one of the most important parts of Bitcoin is having actual control over your money, right? Because if you don't control your own keys, then it's not really your Bitcoin. You know, the whole point what are of keys? this. Is I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> and it's gone. No, but I mean, you know, the whole point of the system, right, is to be able to con control your own keys and own your own money and, and cut out the middlemen, right? Cut out that party that, you know, like the government or the bank that normally you would have to trust. And as we've seen over the last decades is like constantly abused our trust right over time. And so the only real way to do that is to store your own Bitcoin for yourself. And when you're doing that, you really only have a couple options, right? One is to store it on your phone. But if you're storing more than, I would say, a few hundred bucks or like a thousand dollars, you probably don't want to store that on your phone. You want to have that on a more secure device. Or you could store it on your computer. But when you're using a computer, it's typically connected to the internet. And there's a lot of different attack vectors to close off of. So the great thing about buying a hardware wallet is that it's a single purpose device. Um, it is hopefully air gapped, uh, meaning that it has no connections of any kind to the internet or even to another computer. Um, and it's specifically designed to store Bitcoin keys and sign Bitcoin transactions. So what's cool about our hardware wallet, which is called Passport, is that it's already really easy to use, has a larger screen, 1.8 inch screen, and a full keypad, and navigation pad. It almost looks kind of like, uh, like an older mobile phone, but it's a lot smaller. Um, the addition. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, it's completely air-gapped, which means that it actually does not even have a USB port. Uh, it, you can only communicate with it with either a micro SD card or the camera, where you can scan QR codes back and forth. Um, and it's powered by AAA batteries, which are uh, internal in the device, and you can swap them out as you need to, which means that you could throw it in like a drawer for a year. You don't have to worry about your lithium-ion battery exploding, you know, and also you don't have to worry about these, these batteries that typically have like chips in them, you know, where they could be collecting data, for example, because they're like smart batteries. There's really no such thing as like a dumb lithium-ion battery. And so uh, you can use it also with your preferred software wallet of choice. So if you already use, you know, actually, yeah, what, what wallet do you like to use? Software Ooh, wallet. Uh, Electro. Cool. So you can Hell use yeah. it with any wallet that supports <laughs> PSBTs, which includes Electrum. I think right now Electrum, I don't know if it works over QR codes yet, the new release, but I know you can do PSBTs over micro SD. And if they do support QR codes, then you can do that over QR codes too. So uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the short pitch for uh, why you'd want to buy a, a passport and uh, use a hardware wallet. Sold because I like the name. Awesome, nice. awesome, dude! Thank that was you. that was great. I put you on the spot and you thrived. I love it. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm pitching all day this thing. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So, um, um, okay. So Zach, on one of one of, um one of your tweets, I saw mm. that you said, and and I love this question because. I feel like this is going to be porn to Rick. Um, Zach, I saw that on one of your tweets, uh, you were 3D printing uh, a device. Could you oh, yeah. could, look at this, Rick? Is this this a, oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that one. I, already, uh, I think I actually replied on that one or something. This I think is a you nice did. Yeah, piece yeah. of hardware. <laughs> you, said, you, you guys said you had a Form 3, which I think you said like broke, right, recently? Yeah, my Form 3 oh. just broke, so I got, a, oh, I got RM8. I'm getting a new one here the, next weekend already. If you ever need a good connection, one of my co-founders, uh, Jacob, uh, who's our head of supply chain, actually worked at Form Labs for a few years before working with us. So uh, if I need another cheap one. Maybe I can get a connection. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love this. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. Go on, Nico. Yeah. Yeah. So, dude, could like for anybody that doesn't know, and then we kind of touched upon this on Rick's podcast um, a little bit, but kind of want to hear a little bit from Zach. So, Zach, 
how does this work, man? And why is it orange? Yeah. Uh, so, and, and Rick is probably going to want to add stuff onto this. Absolutely. This no, you got it. I, I took care of FDM. You, you can take care of SLA. So yeah, so so SLA printing, this is a type of printing where instead of, you know, if you think about a normal 3D printer that you see, like the ones that Rick is usually posting pictures of, kind of has like a little nozzle and is kind of, you know, shooting out plastic and then melting the plastic as it prints up. This thing is crazy. Uh, for, this is the Form 3 from Form Labs, an SLA printer. Um, it actually prints upside down. And what it does is it uses a liquid resin. So you can see kind of to the, to the right of the printer on, in that photo, there's a tank over there on the side, like a tank, and that's a tank of resin. And so you actually, uh, now over, over on the right side of this the one? image there. Yeah, that thing. So that's a, that's a tank of resin. And you actually uh, lock that tank into the printer and it fills up a tray with liquid resin. You do not want to spill that on your carpet like I did last week. <laughs> um, but, I got, but, but basically what it does is um, it, it has a build platform that lowers itself into the resin. But then it has a laser that goes back and forth, shooting the laser up at the resin in order to form more complex geometry. So what's really cool about that is that you can have very high resolution parts down to 25 microns, which as Rick would tell you, is very small. Um, it's and, insane, the quality of these things. They're better than injection molding, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, they're incredible. And when we were trying to decide, you know, uh, how are we gonna do our prototyping, you know, for our hardware products, all our products, like our roadmap for the next at least, you know, 12, 18 months, they're all things that are relatively small and could fit on a build platform like this. And so we said, you know, we might as well drop $5,000 for the 3D printer because we were getting some quotes from, uh, you know, prototyping facilities where they do professional 3D printing to prototype devices. And you could drop a couple thousand dollars on a single run of prototypes. Meanwhile, on a single tank of resin, we, we, we calculated that we could do like 50 runs of our, of our full print for, for our for Passport. So um, you get some really cool stuff. The, the downside, and here's, here's like, this is a solid model. This is one of our, this is an older model that we did. Um, when we were just trying to get like the fit and finish in our hand, just for a sense of scale, it's, it's you know, a lot smaller than an iPhone. So it's a pretty, pretty tiny device. Uh, the downside though, is you have to use a lot of these supports where it like prints plastic supports onto the device. And they're really annoying to get off. You might be able to see the back is filled with like little like indents. And I actually kind of sanded them down a bit. Um, but you run into a lot of, you know, you basically have to rip off all these supports and like sand it down and do stuff like that. But it's an amazing technology. And, um, you know, I don't know how reliable it is because because Rick, Rick's broke. <laughs> but, but I don't it's, know. It's, it's Me awesome either. Product. Like I thought it was going to last years and it was six months. But I was like, oh right. boy, this isn't good. And we've only had this uh, for like, oh, I don't know, one to two months. I've kind of lost my sense of time in quarantine. But whenever we post that photo, I think it was it was a relatively new purchase for us. Yeah. Got you. Awesome, man. That, that, that was a, that was a hands full, but that's fucking, <laughs> that's fucking cool, man. Um, so Rick, um, I'm a fan. Uh, I just bought some of your dank. Oh wait, wrong thing. There we go. I just bought some of oh, your nice. dank cup holders. Uh, you won't yeah, know buddy. it's me. I used, <laughs> I used a weird name. Uh, Every single time, I'll never might, find you. If it's someone in Florida, one of them and me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, dude, these are these are fucking dope. Uh, could you talk to me about what, why you wanted to design something like this? Uh, like, how did you go about designing? Did you design this yourself? Like, I don't even know where to start. No. So this one, this is the best part about starting to like grow as a company right it used to be only me and i would only come up with designs and it was slow and i couldn't i couldn't just think outside the box as much as i wanted to but now that i have lami on here as a design engineer on our team he he will go out and just start making cool shit and this is something that he actually designed and brought to me he's like hey bitcoin coaster here we go we should start selling these or put them on the file factory for people to print i'm like this is awesome people are gonna freaking love these things so then I just toss them on the file factory because that's what we want to do. We want to eventually do more and more op open source stuff where people can print on their own, right? Where we don't always 
want to charge for it if they have printers. So this is one of those things, and and people love them, which is which makes sense. I love these things, and the best part is when we started doing the dual color, it it really took it to a no, a new level. And that's Dude. one of the things you can only do on on the the type of three D printers that you have, right? Because unfortunately, with the like the, the printer I have, the Form Three you can't print in like different colors in the same print. So a lot of the really cool crypto cloak stuff is in multiple colors and it looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, That's SLA so printers are limited down to just one material. Yeah. That is one of the downfalls where like with FDM, you can, it, it, it really just depends on how many nozzles you've got coming in. You can do a single nozzle, but then have like a Palette 2 Pro where we have where you have four different materials and colors you can do all at once. And it'll actually cut and splice the different filaments together as it prints. But this, this one was easy, and I, I made sure everybody knows how to do it. You just randomly pause your printer as soon as you hit those upper layers. You take your filament out, put a new one in, and you just keep resuming, and it will honestly just start printing that second color perfectly. Dude, awesome. they're, 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 super, they're super gorgeous, and I just wanted to share another one of Rick's masterpieces. Um, I don't Again, because now you said that the company's grown, so... I don't know if you designed this or not, so I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot like I have been, but I'm just going to pull up one of Crypto Cloak's products and I'll share it with you guys. Uh, let's go here. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> no, so, see, that's another. That's not even mine either. We're, we're wait, wait, wait. So, so I'm going to add I'm gonna add a little question on here, kind of put you on the spot, Rick. Yeah. So yeah. there's a cold card there. Will yep. there be a foundation device there very soon? <laughs> Hopefully. I hope also, so. I love to hear it. So, I so love every to hear single it. hard wallet, every single hard wallet, we want to make mounts and stuff for if they don't do it already, because that's mm -hmm. literally what we started out as a company. That's awesome. And what's man. Uh, what's what's cool too about about Passport and and here's like a like a better model. Oh, I'll, I'll, hold on. If you could uh, take off the screen yep. share for a second, got it. yeah. So it, this is a better model. I, it doesn't have all the pieces in. I have like keypad pieces and stuff out, but we actually this is what the device actually looks like where you have slots for the AAA batteries. And then we have a, a back plate um, that we're gonna put, be putting a magnet on. And so you basically magnetize the back plate on. So we're able to have like different color back plates. That means someone like Crypto Cloaks could like 3D print, like cut completely custom back plates. And all you have to do is glue a little magnet on the back. It's like a standard size magnet I think we're doing. And then you can just like swap out your back cover. So in addition to the other cool stuff, I hope that people will want to like customize and personalize, you know, their passport. Uh, and and yeah, well, we'll see what people do. Oh, but, uh, dude, yeah. you guys could work yeah. together, man. I'm, I'm custom so custom back excited. plates, dude. I'm yeah. noting it down already. I, I love, I love, <laughs> man. I love crypto because you you see so much of this cool. Um, okay. Oh, he's so. actually noting it down. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm definitely going to put it down, man. I, I don't joke around about this. I need to organize myself. I don't no, this is intense. <laughs> um, don't mind me. Okay, so, Zach, um, look, I, I, I was reading, I was going over your uh, uh, Foundation Devices Twitter, and you mentioned, um, you mentioned basically a phrase that I'm familiar with, but I, and, and uh, you know, again, you're going to be selling these. So I just want people to understand what this means. So on your Twitter, you mentioned in tweets and in the description, open hardware. So could you yeah. explain what that is to everybody and why that's important? Because I know that everyone yeah. knows about open source, but what is open hardware? Yeah, for sure. And an open source software, it's pretty straightforward, right? You, you basically have the code completely available on a place like GitHub where you can download it, you can audit it, you can review it, and you can even build it yourself from source and, and know what it's doing. It's a lot more complicated in hardware because you have to buy all these components from all these different companies that go on your circuit board. So what open hardware means is that uh, you have an open source uh, software layer on the device. Oh yeah, that's, uh, I, can show you, I can show some more cool stuff on here. That's, uh, that's kind of a teaser we posted. But basically you have, you know, open source firmware on the device where the firmware is posted on GitHub, right? And you can actually download that, audit that, build it from source, install it on the device. But we actually also open up the circuit board designs. In our case, both the circuit board schematics that you can give to an electrical engineer and they can go kind of uh, understand how the wallet works and they can even build it themselves. But also I don't think any other hardware wallet company has done this yet. 
but the actual circuit board design files that you could take to a manufacturer or like a rapid prototyper and say, hey, you know, make me the circuit board and then completely build it from scratch yourself. Uh, the reason why companies don't like to do that, you'll sometimes see them post schematics, but they don't like to share design files is because it's, it's months of work. <laughs> um, a lot you know, of work. It it's a lot of work, but we're just, you know, but it's important to us because like, if we're going to ask you to buy a hardware wallet from us, then if you're an expert user, if you're say an electrical engineer or a hobbyist, and you, you might have some soldering equipment at home, you might even know how to do like, you know, get a circuit board and do like some prototyping and so forth, get something made for yourself. You should be able to build yourself a passport from scratch without needing any information from us. You know, you should be able to go on our GitHub and do that. And why that's important is because, you know, like think about Bitcoin. Bitcoin only works because it's open source. Like if Bitcoin was closed source, you wouldn't even know that there was a 21 million Bitcoin limit, right? You would have to trust whoever was running the Bitcoin code, that that's the case, and they could change it at any time. So by being open source, you know exactly how Bitcoin works. And if you yourself are not a software developer, you can at least trust, you know, dozens, hundreds of experts who you might follow on Twitter or other places, right? And understand how it works or, or trust their judgment, right? Or trust that they've looked at it. How do you run open source software on top of closed source hardware? Like to me, that doesn't make any sense because sometimes the hardware can modify the software as it's running or the hardware can be compromised in some way. So like if you say, I have a hardware wallet, it's storing your Bitcoin private keys. But like, if you won't tell me, if you won't give me the full circuit schematics, or if you won't tell me who, manu like what manufacturer made the security chip in your device, if that's all secret, then how do I trust you as a manufacturer? And, and how do I even like, I don't even know who your, who your component suppliers are that you're buying from. I, I can't even form an opinion. And so that's why it's like really important to make all this information available so you can, you can go online and you can say, oh, I know who made the security chip that they're buying. I can look at the schematics for the board. I can look at the firmware, so on. I can even build it myself. And so it's, it's just really important. And um, it was never really important before Bitcoin because like you couldn't steal someone's money, right? It could just, it could just be reversed by the bank. So who cares if like, you know, your credit card, is it has closed source hardware inside right but now because transactions are immutable and it's so important to keep your keys safe it really does matter you know that you're using open source hardware absolutely and 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 i, I love that because it, it's basically that's bitcoin's essence right the fact that yeah. you could build your own you could build the bitcoin software and you could run it yourself right so you know that's what that's what makes it Sorry, my girlfriend's dad. Anyways, that's what makes that's what makes it great, right? Is um, you know, basically that anyone could add. I mean, in theory, anyone could add to the Bitcoin project, right? You could just kind of fork the code and work on it yourself. So I, I really like that, man. That's really interesting. Um, and again, that kind of adds to Foundation's philosophies. Uh, I mean, Foundation Devices philosophy, right? So that's really cool, dude. Um, and I'm, Rick, I'm curious yeah. too. I want to ask Rick, Rick something actually. Of course. Yeah. Like one of, <laughs> I'm taking, sorry, Nick, I'm taking over. No, no, here. man, dude, <laughs> bro, this is the whole point of the podcast, man. Go but ahead. Like, like one of our person, like one of our theories and like my personal theory is that like, like we've seen so much progress in the digital world, but we haven't seen as much progress in the physical world, right? In the last few decades, like the whole, the whole quote about, you know, like, we were promised flying cars and instead we got, you know, like, like Twitter. Right. And, and I actually think <laughs> one of the reasons for that is because um, uh, open source software, you can like build on each other's achievements. You can, someone else makes a cool QR code scanner. You can add that to your app. You don't have to build it from scratch and hardware. It feels like all these different companies are building the same thing from scratch all the time. So I'm curious, Rick, what you think about that and like how, 3D printing could play a role in, in blowing that open. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, that's why I think it, it is important to bring constantly open source designs and you let every, everybody in the world is so creative, right? And you, and you think about it and you go, yeah, I can design something, but there's, there's somebody out there that has something that can make it better. They have an idea that they can take your design and make it better. 
And the big thing is like why we run a shop is really just to keep like get money to grow as a company to really bring more open source designs out because everything that we bring out that anybody can take out of the file factory and change it to what they want. And there's always people even that don't want to make the changes. They just let us know the changes and then we, and then we add them to it. So I, I truly believe that I think patents in general are good for companies to grow, but they also stop technology from really evolving more and more and more because they lock down that idea where somebody then has to waste years to regain all the knowledge that that one company has on a patent right? instead of just taking it and building on top of, like you said, I, it, it, it really helps when you can just constantly build off somebody else. And that's how you, you go so fast. And I think that's why software is completely destroying hardware in terms right. of expansion. Yeah, for sure. Cool, 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 man. This is awesome, dude. I, I love Bitcoiners, man. It's just, <laughs> you just, just go into the rabbit hole deeper and deeper. So, um, I'm kind of, I'm going to kind of add on that a little bit. Um, uh, what you said, Rick, which is basically anyone could take from a file factor and kind of do what they want. Rick, I saw that you collaborated with Lucho and you did a limited edition art piece. Um, I had Lucho on, on the podcast the other day, man, that guy is so deep. He, he, he just comes up, up with these incredible art pieces. Uh, really you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, we keep doing sneak peeks and Lami keeps getting pissed at me because he's the one that has to print all these things. Uh, and, then, and each unit takes 224 hours to print. Oh and then we have to assemble it. So, and it's big. But this, this is our latest piece that we're working with Lucho on and just taking his, his amazing deep art that he has like in his story and we wanted to bring it to a different, um, what is it? Uh, not material, but what, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, medium? Medium, yes. We wanted <laughs> to try to take his art to a different medium. And I think that's what these lithos are doing. His first one sold out even before we could even get all of them finished printing. And we, want to, and we wanted to take his ideas and really take it to the next level on this one. So we made it a little bit bigger. We put a smart bulb in there. And... And he's loving it. We're loving it. And I think everybody else is really loving the lithos. This looks awesome. I saw this on Twitter, but I wasn't even sure what it was. <laughs> yeah, there's, so, so there's, a, there's a custom box that we 3D print. There's a light bulb in there, a smart light that you can connect to your cell phone. You can control all the effects that it has. We, we posted another video where it actually, the LEDs go with the sound or whatever's around it outside and it'll actually flash and move with that. So yeah. That that's one of our latest artwork pieces that we got going on. Sick man, sick. Sorry, there's some music going on. Oh my god! Like I said, I'm sorry, guys. The the this quarantine has been stuck here. Anyways, um, Zach, I'm gonna ask you some technical questions. Um, okay, so Zach, you said what is the importance of assembling in America? Can you? How do you update the device? Is it through you? Is it through the SD card? And could you talk to me a little bit about the secure element that you're using? Sure. So start with the update the device because that's the easiest, easiest one of the questions. Uh, so yeah, over the micro SD card for now, uh, we'd really like to do another iteration in the future where we don't even have a micro SD card slot and we're just communicating with the camera and QR codes and doing firmware updates over the camera. But that's like, that's what? tough. And, you, and we would need to do the firmware like from scratch extremely efficiently and spend a lot of effort on that. And it's just not something we had time to do right now. So, so for now, just similar process to the cold card, we are copying the firmware file you know, onto a micro SD card. Um, with regard to the secure element, we're actually using the same part that cold card uses, which is from microchip, the 608A. Microchip is a US company. The 608A, while the data sheet itself isn't completely open. There's a version of it that's pretty robust that is open, which is really helpful. Um, and it's the same architecture as cold card where it uses like a standard processor and it uses the secure element chip and the private keys are encrypted and stored on the secure element chip. So the secure element doesn't actually have the decrypted private key. It has an encrypted private key and then the normal processor has the encryption key. So you, need, you would need to compromise both chips in order to extract the private key. Um, and the only attack that we've seen successful against that model 
was something Ledger was able to accomplish on the previous generation cold card, which uses the previous generation secure element chip with a multi hundred thousand dollar attack that has an extremely high risk of failure on the first try because we're using a laser to try to slice off layers of the chip and one mistake and you've just fried the chip and, and you know, you're, you're done. So it's a really great security model, an open source security model, you know, using a component from a, from a US manufacturer and, uh, and so that's what we're doing as well. We actually did more than that though. We, we forked cold cards uh, firmware because we're a new hardware wallet company. We don't want to um, release a completely brand new firmware from scratch into the wild and say, yeah, trust us, you know, it hasn't been used before, but like, you know, go put your Bitcoin on here. Everything's gonna be fine. So you know, we redid the entire user interface. We, we did, added the camera support. We made a ton of changes uh, to the interface and so forth. But it's still that same base firmware that Cold Card has been building for years, you know, which is open source firmware. And that's another great example of, you know, the importance of open source. And then the U.S. manufacturing, um, I think there's a few different elements here. But one is like, I personally really want to buy a hardware wallet made in the U.S. I think it makes sense if you care a lot about Bitcoin security to, you know, think about hardware wallets and, and multi-sig setups, not just in terms of the manufacturer but in terms of where the manufacturer is making the product to kind of minimize supply chain risk. So like if you wanted to do a multi-sig setup, you grab a cold card, which is made in Canada, you grab a passport, which will, which will be made in the US, you know, you have an added level of security because they're completely different supply chains. Also, it gives us much more control over our supply chain. We're gonna able to be you know, on the factory floor uh, we're buying all our components through U.S. component suppliers, which I think is must, much more trustable than buying it from like random vendors in China where the quality controls might not be there. Like even though the components often originate from Asia, um, we're still going through U.S. distributors that are very reputable. And then also, you know, the geopolitical situation with, with China right now is crazy. And, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners write about it. And, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people outside the Bitcoin space as well. I think we're kind of in the beginning of like a technology cold war with China, you know, kind of fighting over ideals, right? Where, you know, China uses technology and the internet in order to really like control the population. And, you know, more in the Western world, we think about the internet as hopefully something that can give like freedom and sovereignty to people, especially in like the Bitcoin world. And those ideals are like completely contradictory. And so, you know, if you fast forward 10 years and every, and you think every device is gonna be using Bitcoin, like cell phones, routers, computers, most of that stuff is made in China now. And so if we can start to build the capacity here to learn how to make complex electronic devices again, like phones and so forth, then that could be incredible for our society and for building, I think, a more robust Bitcoin network, a more robust internet. And so we're starting with the hardware wallet, which is a relatively simple device in terms of manufacturing. And hopefully over this decade, we can work our way up to more complicated stuff like phones while still making all of it in the U.S. Awesome, awesome, man. Uh, so, Zach, uh, last, last question. Uh, talk to us a little bit about Zach, last question before I move on to Rick's last question. And then we're gonna sure. get into the speculative aspect of the podcast, which is price speculation. Oh my God, my hair is crazy. Guys, I'm so sorry. Anyways, <laughs> this has been- Don't matter, matter, man. This, is, this podcast is like 2020. Anyways, um, so <laughs> Zach, show us your website, man. Oh yeah, I'll do a quick peek. Um, this is not completely finished, but I think by the time the pod airs, it will be finished. Um, and we'll have it up probably uh, in the next few days. So uh, let me see what we got. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes, sir. So yeah, this is uh, this is Passport. Um, so uh, we've been trying to you know build this brand that feels you know like I mentioned really well designed, really intuitive and approachable, more like open you know as opposed to like super super dark or anything like that. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna be launching the website and, and basically doing email reservations um, for
for, for Passport. We're going to launch pre-orders probably sometime in mid to late August. And there's going to be a special edition for the first version where we're, where we're going to give like a free gift. So the first thousand uh, email addresses will essentially reserve their spot for the special edition. Um, but yeah, so we talked about reclaiming your sovereignty and why it's important to use a hardware wallet, you know, so that you can really be in control of your Bitcoin. We show off some design elements. Like uh, what I really love is that this is actually going to be, uh, it's a combination of soft touch plastic, which has a really premium feel. But then we have this interior structure where we're going to, where the batteries are stored. And it's actually a uh, zinc alloy that's plated in real copper. So it's going to look really, really sick. And we have some prototypes coming in uh, in a few weeks that are going to be with those actual real materials. Um, so we got the camera, we got the micro SD slot featured. We talked about the interface. The interface actually looks a lot like the original iPod interface. Um, and that was intentional. We thought, let's go with something that people are really comfortable with, giving them the option to sign with a QR code or sign with a micro SD card. Physical keypad for secure text entry because- Does it have snake? I, cannot, yeah, right. I can neither confirm nor deny snake oh. well, well we'll 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 see we'll see um <laughs> <laughs> but you're not the first person who's asked that and uh i think i think you'll like what we end up shipping um what most people don't realize about touch screens is that you know you buy a touch screen it usually comes from china and it has in multiple embedded computer chips inside the touch screen running firmware that the manufacturer installs so we've been super careful with the device to try to do things like a physical keypad so you know exactly how it works. It doesn't have any weird chips that might have unknown firmware. With a special screen, it is a monochrome display, but it actually has the circuitry etched into the glass. So there's no chip inside the screen. So you can like visually inspect the screen at, at production and make sure it hasn't been tampered with. So there's a lot of cool stuff there. We talk about the open source security model, um, put together this fun graphic. I like that where it shows off the circuit board and this is actually some of the QR code scanning code um, and uh, talk about how the device is air gapped and some other security features. So this is the copper interior. It's going to look so cool. And for the battery contacts, uh, instead of like little springs, we have um, gold plated like push pins. So it's very, uh, it's like a very premium type feel when it comes to the batteries, which I think is pretty sweet. And here's your removable back cover. So we're gonna ship this in multiple colors, but of course you could, you know, make and customize your own if you wanted to. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, talking about how it's assembled in the, in the USA and comparing it to a cup of coffee, you know, for size. Um, and, you know, like I mentioned, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot smaller than an iPhone. It's, it's four inches long and one and a half inches wide and less than an inch thick. And we also have a specs page that, you know, you'll be able to walk through to learn more about the components, you know, uh, the communication, security features, dimensions, you know, images of the key components on the circuit board and so on. So we're really excited to launch the website. Hopefully by the time this, this podcast is out, uh, you know, we'll have it, we'll have it up there. The most important awesome. question, what is the price? So we're still trying to figure that out. All right. I was um, just curious because I'm interested. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be between $250 and $300. Um, so it's definitely a little bit more of a premium option. Uh, we've sourced all the components, but we're still comparing some quotes on the actual injection molding for the plastic and on the zinc alloy casting, you know, with the copper plating. And so once we get the exact cost down, then we're gonna decide on the final pricing, but it'll be somewhere between there. What's cool though, is we're including AAA batteries with the purchase uh, and we're including uh, an industrial grade micro SD card that you can use to back up your seed. So you don't have to actually write down the full 24 words. You can, you can back it up to a micro SD card and then encrypt that micro SD card, which is something cold card already does. And it's really, really cool. Um, and so if you went to go look at like, you know, a Trezor Model T, I think that's around 179 or something or one or 170. And if you bought a cold card with a micro SD card from them with the cold power battery attachment, um, I think you get also around to 170 or 180. So it's a little bit more premium, 
but uh, I think I think everyone's really gonna like the design and like all the features, and I hope people are impressed by it, you know, and want to buy it. It's looking good, man. It's looking good. And Rick, so you. do you want to tell us what you've been working on? What's the next project for Crypto Cloaks? Holy cow, the next project? I don't even know, man. I got a list of stuff. I've been organizing. I, I've let a few things drop through the cracks. I've fixed that. Uh, let's see. We got Project Apollo uh, that we've been trying to sneak peek with Dan Held coming up, which is going to be huge. I, I, I hope, really hope people like what we designed there. because Tell us more about it. Drop, drop some hints. Yeah, come on. Drop some I, can't, I, can't, I can't drop any more hints, you guys. That is why like is it, straight. Why is it called Apollo? Come on, yeah. <laughs> Project Apollo is literally just like a, a code word that we use. It has nothing to do with the actual like project or what we did. It's going to be awesome. That, that design that, that we did, it took forever, like seven months worth of work to hammer out. And it really turned out amazing. So I'm, I'm really excited for that one. I think it might release Friday or early next week. It all depends. Oh, cool. Um, besides that, uh, I don't know. I, there's just so many different things. I, it's hard to even remember all the all the different projects that I got coming on. Uh, we want to uh, we we did that rat poison case that uh, crowdfunded by the community. It's like in the shape of literally one of those poison rat boxes. Uh, rat squared is what they call it. I'm finishing up with that one to get that one out. Uh, and then it's just it's literally just trying to keep up with orders at this point. It's printing off grenades, honey badgers, uh, lightning shells. Uh, I guess everything that we have out right now. Man, that's 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 freaking awesome. And guys, we're gonna get into my favorite part of the podcast. We're gonna get into price speculation territory. <laughs> uh, huge asterisk, guys. We're just kind of BSing here. Don't take any of this, you know, at face value. But I'm gonna start the 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 questions with what do you guys think of plan B stock to flow? Uh, I guess I can start. Uh, I love it because everybody loves seeing that the number is going to jump up to a hundred thousand. Um, it hasn't been wrong yet. And that's what everybody's saying. Who, who knows what's going to happen. I know it's all speculative. Would I really enjoy if it jumped up? Absolutely. Cause then I could probably go full-time crypto cloaks. So that yeah. I'm, I'm totally down for a hundred K <laughs> Then I can go full-time crypto cloaks. I can stop my nine to five and actually do what I've been wanting to do for the last three years. Dude, so he updated his out. model to 288k. Oof. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I don't know. I I don't know. There's so much controversy over this stock to flow model, right? And and so I wanted. I try to stay out of the controversy, but dig I think deep. it's fun. Dig deep. I I think it really. I think it helps for someone who's like new to Bitcoin and trying to figure out why it has value. I think the model makes sense because you know, you're comparing, uh, you're basically treating Bitcoin as another like precious metal with a defined supply and a known inflation rate or issuance rate, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so to be able to compare it to other precious metals like gold and then try to fit it onto some chart, I don't know if that's the best comparison in terms of price action because there's so much that influences price. But I think it's like a great explainer for someone that might be familiar with you know, why, why gold has value, you know, through its scarcity and, and, and maybe be able to try to fit Bitcoin into that same category and talk about how, I think it's in this epoch, right, where it's scarcity uh, becomes, uh, it becomes more scarce than gold, you know, based on the stock to flow. I don't know if that's already happened or if it's going to happen in this 2020 to 2024 period. So I like it. Uh, 288K, that sounds great to me. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So second to last question is what, uh, I'm going to start with you, Rick. What is your target for the end of 2021? What will the Bitcoin price be at? Bitcoin price at the end of 2021. Uh, let's go with, oh man, I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to do 51588. Okay. Very specific. I like it. I like it. What about? Yeah, I might you? as well. I might as well go for go for gold there. Go for gold. I think I I think we'll we'll pass 100k. I'm I'm on the boat. I'm on the boat I with think Zach. We'll pass 100k. Let's see what happens. And I don't know if it'll be there by the end, but you know, I I think I think we'll, we will at the next at the next bull market, which I think will be 
in the next, you know, 18 months, but. Hell, it's 2020, it. so we'll probably get yeah. there this year anyways. It's either <laughs> going to crash it. major or hit moon. It's I know, right? That, that's, that's what it looks like. Um, so uh, in the last podcast, I asked Rick what his favorite ice cream, and his answer was the haagen peanut butter. Fucking love that. And I'm going to ask yes. you, Zach, because this is Crypto Creamer's tradition. Yeah. What is your favorite ice cream with the K flavor? So my all, all-time favorite ice cream is uh, Ben & Jerry's Coffee Coffee Buzz Buzz Buzz. Oh, my God. I love it. Coffee ice cream with espresso chocolate chips. And I think they that still make delicious. it. So it's, it's quite good. <laughs> Highly recommended. Uh, you, should, you should go get some. Awesome, awesome. What about you, Rick? Second favorite ice cream flavor. Second favorite <laughs> ice cream? I got to think of another one. Uh, I'm going to go with straight vanilla bean uh, ice cream. Vanilla bean. It's love so it. Good. I love it. Simplicity tastes amazing. Nice. Exactly. I love it. I love it. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Crypto Creamers. I apologize about the music. It's 2020. Everything's fucking crazy. If you guys want to go check out and buy the dankest new hardware wallet on the market, go check out Foundation Devices. Zach said the first thousand are going to be special editions, so definitely check that out. I'm going to put all the uh, information down in the description. And if you guys want the most dank 3D printed stuff in the crypto space, I mean Bitcoin space, go check out my homie Crypto Cloaks. I'm going to also link his website down in the description. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Tune into the next one. See you guys later. Oh, by the way, Roger Verse sucks and Craig Wright is a fraud. <laughs>